bringing you the latest in tax credit news, this is Tax Credit Tuesday with your host, Michael Novogratik. Hello, I'm Michael Novogratik, and this is Tax Credit Tuesday. This is the February 7th, 2023 podcast. The fiscal year 2023 round of the Capital Magnet Fund is now on, and the deadline to apply is March 21st. We have a great episode today where we're going to discuss why affordable housing nonprofits and for-profits should seriously consider applying for an award if they're eligible to. More importantly, we're going to discuss ways to improve the competitiveness of your application. But let me start by giving an overview of the Capital Magnet Fund. The source of funding for the Capital Magnet Fund comes from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. More specifically, the amount available for awards is a percentage of the new business generated by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in a given year. Now, Capital Magnet Fund awards must be used to further the development, renovation, and or preservation of affordable housing. And there is nearly $321 million that will be awarded in this, the 2023 round. Both nonprofit and certain for-profit organizations with an affordable housing mission are eligible to apply for this funding. Now, as you listen to this podcast, you might be thinking the Capital Magnet Fund is a competitive process. Completing the application does take considerable time. Is it really worth applying? And that's an excellent question. It's a question you should be asking yourself. And my response is that in order to answer that question, you may want to know what the recent success rate has been. And the most recent funding round, and that would be for fiscal year 2021, there was a roughly similar amount, 336 million to be exact, that was awarded, which is the amount available in the current round approximately. Now, in that prior round, there were 146 applicants. And of those 146 applicants, 59 received awards. That success rate is 40%. And the average award size was $5.7 million, with awards ranging from 950,000 to 12 million. Now, we obviously don't know yet how many applicants there'll be for this 2023 round, and we don't know what the success rate will be. But since in the past round, 40% of applicants were successful, and the average and the award sizes were up to 12 million, with the average award size of 5.7 million, I think many. Eligible applicants, many of you as listeners, if you are eligible to apply, are going to conclude it as well worth the effort. So to further this podcast, joining me on today's episode are two Novogratic Capital Magnet Fund experts. They've helped many clients over the years apply for, and more importantly, successfully win Magnet Fund Awards. And they are my partners, Amanda Reed and Brett Parker. And we have a lot of useful tips to cover today. So if you're ready, Let's get started. Amanda and Brent, welcome back to Cash Road Tuesday. Happy to be back. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And I assume you're happy to be back too, Brent. Very happy to be back. <laughs> <laughs> How else were you going to answer that question? Man, you said it perfectly. <laughs> uh, so let's start with the basics for listeners. I gave a real brief uh, overview of the Capital Magnet Fund. But I thought, Brett, maybe you could start by explaining a little bit more as to what the Capital Magnet Fund is. Sure. So, uh, so Capital Magnet Fund is a program within the CDFI Fund, CFI being Community Development Financial Institutions Fund, which is the, a component of Treasury. And that's also the same component that sort of uh, manages new market tax credit allocations. Uh, so, so it's a competitively awarded grant. Helps to finance uh, affordable housing solutions and community right, revitalization efforts benefit, you know, low-income people, anywhere from low-income to extremely low-income people in a variety of ways. Just to expand a little bit on what community revitalization efforts means, uh, there's basically, a, you can use up to 30% of the award to finance economic development activities, uh, which is basically activities that are, you know, uh, that are, that are developed and a concerted strategy with the affordable housing component. So community service facilities, things like that. As we're going to discuss going forward here, you can use it in a, in a ton of different ways, but the focus is affordable housing, obviously. So thank you for emphasizing that affordable housing focus. And I'm sure listeners are wondering, who are familiar with the Capital Magnet Fund, 
is what are some of the ways that capital mega fund awards can be used? So maybe Amanda, you could give some examples as to how your clients have used capital magnet funds in the past. Sure. So for the use of the funds, there's kind of four main buckets. I would say that it says you're allowed to use the funds for one would be loan funds. Another is risk sharing loans. Another is loan guarantees. And then you can also do a loan loss reserve. For the loan funds, they even say in the application, you can either have a revolving loan fund or they say an affordable housing loan fund. So either one of those kind of count. You can also use the award, like Brent was saying earlier, you can use a percentage of the award for uh, economic development activities, 30% of it. You can also use part of the award for direct administrative expenses. Now you can only use 5% of the award for that. So it's not much, but those are other two categories that you can maybe use a portion of the award for. For typically what I would see, I, I usually see the loan funds as, as the main item, the revolving loan fund or the affordable housing loan fund that usually gets created with the award. And they usually are there to help fund gaps and light tech projects, but they can have many different uses. That's just one I think I typically see a lot is that they're going to put them down as loans to projects to kind of help with a gap that they have. And one other item is you do have to be able to demonstrate that with your capital magnet fund award that you that it will result in eligible project costs and that's defined in the frequently asked questions and the application itself but you have to be able to prove that your eligible project costs will equal at least 10 times the amount of the award that you're asking for so those are just some of the uses that i would see typically okay and we talked about the eligible project costs equaling at least 10 times the award that's really just a leverage factor they want to see exactly that. Amount exactly. leveraged tenfold. Yes. Right. Yes. You were going to say something? Yeah. And I think also focus on private sources, you know, which things like low income housing tax credit would you would find yes. and things like that. So, you know, maybe a 10 to one for private and maybe something above that, a 20 to one or something overall might work. I don't know, Amanda, what you see typically there. Yeah. And I would say I de definitely 10 is the minimum. I would say to really be competitive. I right. want to be closer to 20, like Brent's saying, but on a lot of these projects, you can count all different sources of the project as leverage. So a lot of times it's not too hard to get to that percentage. So Brent, I'm good. glad that you mentioned low value tax credits because many of our listeners work with other community development incentives. This is Tax Credit Tuesday the podcast. Uh, and the other credits that come to mind in this, for this, uh, overlay with capital magnet funds would be the low housing tax credit and new markets tax credit. So maybe you could share with listeners a little bit more about how capital magnet funds can be used with other tax incentives. Sure. It's, it's a no brainer for low income housing tax credit. Number one, uh, there's affordability requirement on, you know, CMF funded or leveraged projects of a 10 year. And so that works, you know, very well with low income housing tax credits, but CMF Ward in leveraged funds have to be financing unit at level 120 percent AMI, uh, with really more than 50 percent of that you know serving populations below 80 percent AMI. And if you want to really score well, hit the priority scoring uh, points, uh, which you know number one, if you have 45 percent or more of your CMF award uh, and leveraged cost financing unit that are below 50 percent AMI, that's a big bump. Uh, there's other sort of there would be scoring points, you know, areas of high housing opportunity areas and areas of economic distress and things like that. But, uh, but I think it's EMI, the low EMI is very critical. So it pairs well with light tech. Also, you know, you mentioned new market tax credit. So new market tax credit is obviously designed to focus on commercial activities in low income communities. But, you know, as we know, usually these projects are mixed use projects. So. Uh, the CMF award works very well with that to target the housing component of a mixed use project and the new market serving that commercial side. Got it. Thank you for that. And that's helpful in terms of getting a level set, if you will, as to how the capital magnet funds can be used. Uh, now that listeners are probably looking at kind of going, well, that's some of the activities that I'm engaged in. So maybe I do want to think about applying. Amanda. Who is eligible to apply for capital magnet fund awards? So there's two kinds of entities that are eligible to apply. The first one is you need to be a certified CDFI 
And that needs to be at the time that the notice of funding availability, which or they call it the NOFA, that was issued with the application, you had to be a certified CDFI at that time. So that's already past that day. So if you're not a certified CDFI today, not eligible. But the other way you could qualify is be a nonprofit organization operating with a principal purpose of developing or managing affordable housing. So nonprofits can work, but that needs to kind of be your principal purpose and mission. Okay. So if you're a for-profit, you'd have to be a certified CDFI time the notice of funding availability was issued, which I should point it out is passed for this round. And if you're a nonprofit, you have to have the development or managing of affordable housing as a principal purpose. Okay. Thank you for that. It's worth uh, recapping those two paths, you know, which basically means if you're a for-profit entity, but not a certified CDFI yet, then you can't apply, which is bad news. <laughs> I guess the good news is you can work on your on getting your CDFI certification now so that next year you could apply. And there's all sure. these other programs, Mike. Yeah, there's all these other programs CDFI has access to. Yes. So aside from this being sort of an annuity annual program that it be annual, but it's proven to be annual, you know, there's all types of other. Okay. No, that's a, a great point. Yeah. I should also note that the CDFI fund has temporarily paused accepting CDFI certification applications, and that's because it's preparing to launch a new uh, certification application. But I'd say even with this pause, if you're for-profit and don't have a certified uh, CDFI, I recommend that you reach out to Amanda or Brett as soon as possible uh, so that you can lay the groundwork to be able to apply for that certification once the process uh, reopens. Which does serve as a segue into my next question, which is if I am not a certified CDFI or not a nonprofit with a pro housing mission, are there ways in which I can still participate in the capital magnet fund since I can't apply directly? Yeah. And you can take that question. That'd be oh, yeah. Perfect. Sorry. It was just jumping in, but, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I would definitely say if you're a for-profit and you're not a certified CDFI, there are definitely still ways you could participate. All you would really need to do is partner up with another certified CDFI or a nonprofit that does have the right mission and purpose and is eligible to apply. And you could partner up with them and help them work on their application and, you know, use your joint pipeline of your deals and their deals to help build a pipeline for the application. So I think there's definitely ways to do it, even if you're not eligible technically this round. Yeah, I have a client. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Brad, please. I have a client that just got recently big, you know, a developer, for-profit developer that just reached out and, you know, was talking with some of their, you know, not, obviously most projects have a nonprofit management general partner. I think that approach is very viable and there's a lot of interest there for profit developers. So thank you for that, Brent. Now let's talk about the application itself. What's some of the types of information that needs to be provided in the application? And obviously we don't, we're not going to go into this in immense detail, but if you could just give us some of the sort of highlights just to give a flavor for listeners. Sure. So, you know, it focuses on application focuses, at least the exhibits focus on a five-year look back and then, you know, a five-year look forward. So you have to have some sort of track record that I think supports your ability to uh, utilize the capital magnet fund in the intended uh, ways. So you have to have track record, you have to have pipeline, uh, have identified projects. Uh, you can disclose that you're using it for certain unidentified projects, but I think to have those identified projects is important. Even if, you know, potentially this is a year out, if you use it on a different project, that's okay as long as meeting uh, the goals set forth in the application. You have to be in existence for three years, uh, legally formed entity for three years. Uh, obviously, you're not in existence for three years. It's going to be hard to show that you have five-year track record. And, and you've got to be able to show like what community impacts you achieve. So different AMIs and all of that. Looking back in. Uh, thank you for that. Now there is a unique change or update or addition, <clears throat> depending on how you view it in the 2023 application. And that is this new consortium approach. 
And when we were preparing for the podcast, we talked about how this new consortium approach option uh, should be able to help historically underrepresented organizations better compete for an award. So Amanda, if you could you know, share with our listeners what this consortium approach is and some of the aspects of it that they should know about. Yeah, perfect. No problem. Yeah. So like, like you were saying, Mike, you know, the reason the CDFI fund kind of created this consortium approach is they kind of wanted to make it helpful for applicants to benefit from a broader capacity and experience of getting to be in a consortium group than they would be individually on their own. So the way that it is written so far in the application for this round is you have to, of course, be at least two entities, but you can't be more than five. So between two to five applicants would apply for the Capital Magnum Fund Award and they would select that they're using this consortium approach. Each member of this consortium group has to otherwise meet all the CMF eligibility requirements. So you still have to be able to be the certified CDFI or the nonprofit with the correct mission in order to apply. And you're each gonna submit your own individual application as well. The actual consortium doesn't need to be like legally formed at all at the time of the application. And then what they do is there are parts of the application that's going to be evaluated based on the consortium as a group. And then there's other parts of the application that still get evaluated as an individual entity basis. And I would say the main items that would make this approach potentially very in incentivized for a, an under underrepresented organization is that the main items are strategy, track record, pipeline and key personnel, those are some of the main categories that they're going to evaluate on a group basis as opposed to individually. It's an interesting thing that they're trying this round, and I'm very interested to see how it goes for these organizations. There's a lot of other criteria. I think we're going to go over in a little bit a deadline that you have to do if you're going to go down that approach. So I, I definitely think if that's something an, a listener is interested in, by all means, could reach out to us and get more info. But yeah, it's the new approach this year. Great. Thank you for that. So Brent, uh, aside from the consortium approach, what else stood out to you about the fiscal year 2023 application? Uh, so, so one thing that CFI fund is going to, you know, allow is an expanded definition of what meets the high opportunity area. So this is like a priority scoring. Uh, criteria. And so there's expanded, the ability to meet an expanded definition that doesn't meet the federal housing finance agency definition. Um, instead, you have to have these three of these four new criteria, uh, being one, uh, high quality youth education opportunities, uh, two employment opportunities, three transportation opportunities, and four financial services opportunities. So you have to hit three of those four, which are, you know, defined in the FAQs and the application criteria or application document. And you have to have them supported by documentation evidencing uh, necessary criteria. So that's the other big uh, 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 adjustment this year. Excellent. So I did say in the intro that we would talk about how to improve the application. And I know that there's a lot of ways in which an applicant can increase their probability for success, but I thought if I could get each of you to share a few, don't give away all your top application tips, <laughs> but you might them to call each of you, <laughs> but if you could, uh, you know, share a few of your top application tips, I think that might encourage more listeners to, uh, reach out to you and whichever you want to go first. Uh, I could go first. I guess one thing I would definitely say is get started early. The application opened up on our January 18th. So we're over two weeks into the application round right now, and you only get about 60 days to do it. So every day counts. And we all know that with every application, I would say, obviously get started early. Definitely talking to a lot of organizations where I'm like, we probably need to for sure decide right now if we're doing that because every day counts right now. So I would say that's definitely one of mine. And then I would also think, you know, hiring a consultant like Novogratic, like us, but hiring somebody that's kind of been through it and knows the application will help tremendously. I feel like new organizations that maybe haven't applied in the past we could use a lot of help with just understanding the application and go working with somebody that's been through it. Um, Brent, I didn't know if, what other items you have. Yeah, those are huge. I think once uh, I would, and hopefully I'm not giving away too much here, but you know, keep it simple. 
All right. So like, you know, I mean, there are human beings that are scoring this application. And so what people intend to do is you get very passionate about your organization and what you want to do. And so people tend to write these very long, you know, narratives that are winding. Uh, just keep it simple. Answer the questions that are being asked. Use headers. and Yeah. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. It's, you got to stay focused on being responsive to the questions. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, as opposed to saying what you want to say. Yeah. And so if for, there are bullets, if there are bullets, make sure you've answered all the bullet points as well. Yeah. But yeah. Yes. So Britt, what tips do you have for previous applicants who have applied and haven't been successful getting an award? They might be thinking, do I really want to apply again? And I know your answer is going to be, yes, you do. So why don't you uh, share some, some of your thoughts when a client comes to you that's been applying and not being successful? Definitely. So, yeah, I mean, first thing is, you know, uh, don't, don't take it too personally. Most people, a lot of applicants fail their first time. So try again, read your application, obviously, you know, read the debriefing document. So, uh, there's going to be something that sort of discusses, uh, what you're doing and what you're sort of, uh, applying. You want us to get into that and read that. It's not going to specifically tell you where you failed exactly, but. Uh, it'll give you a roadmap to do that. Obviously, uh, you know, uh, again, just keep trying. I think, you know, hire consultants to help you. And I think be prepared, obviously, that there's going to be a big time commitment in your organization. I usually tell clients, I'd rather not write the application myself. I'd rather the client write the application, have somebody there because you know your organization and I will help do a detailed review and get into everything. But, but big time commitment. So be prepared for you mentioned the debriefing letter, uh, does the, if you get an award, do you also get a debriefing letter or only if you don't get an award? If you don't get an award, you get a debriefing letter. I don't think you, I think you get a, I don't think you get a No, letter. yeah, you don't. You don't. Yeah. You no, talked I talked about it because you got yeah. the award, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But that does kind of always pose a problem for if you got an award and you right. don't debriefing letter, then you don't know how to make your application better. Right. Uh, you have to try yeah. to go in and read the tea leaves and say what, how could, cause those that got the debriefing letter have a guidance to make it better. Yeah. So yeah. The, the competitive criteria moves up. So it's always a challenge for the successful awardees. It's a challenge everyone wants to have. <laughs> yeah, I know. I actually have a couple, uh, I have a couple winners that won in the last round and they still wish that they had debriefing letters. Yes. So. You're completely right. They were like a shame that we still didn't get a debriefing letter because you're right. How can we still make it better for the next round? Yeah. And you, yeah. they don't yeah. get them. So especially if you're doing, if you want to do different things, you know, I mean, uh, you know, if you did revolving pre-development loan fund originally, and that's, that's your bread and butter. And now you want to try something else, you know, will that addition of a new uh, item sort of mess right. you up? I don't know. Yeah. 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 So let's, let's go on to the deadlines. I mentioned in the intro uh, of a March 21 deadline, but there's earlier benchmarks that if you fail, uh, you're not eligible to apply. So man, if you could kind of walk through the deadline, yeah. I think the first yeah. one, February 23rd. Yes, the first one's February 23rd. That's a big one. So that one is uh, three different items are all due on that day. The first one is you need to create an account in AMIS. And AMIS, if people aren't aware, it stands for Awards Management Information Systems. It's the software within the CDFI fund where you're going to submit your application into. So you just need to create an account for your organization by this date. So that's the first thing you have to do. Say another thing on February 23rd is there is an SF-424 form that is found on grants.gov that needs to be completed by the February 23rd date as well. So those are two things you have to do. Like Mike said, if you don't do those, you're ineligible to apply in March. So those are very critical to get done. The other one is if you are gonna use the consortium approach, like we talked about earlier, for applicants that are thinking about using that, the deadline to submit a service request in AMIS, notifying the Capital Magnet Fund Program of your intent to apply as a consortium, is the February 23rd date as well. So if that's a path you think you wanna go down, you have to submit a service request in by that date, at least letting them know that's your intent. So those are like three big things that are all due on February 23rd. And then 
The only other big date I always kind of say is the last day that you can contact the Capital Magnet Fund staff or the CDFI fund with any questions is March 17th. So they always shut everything down about three to four days before the app is due and they stop all questions. So I always tell my clients that's a very important date too, because if there's anything you want to run by them, that, you know, that's your drop dead date. They don't answer any emails after that day. Yeah. So you have that date. And then like we've been talking about the deadline for the actual application and attachments is March 21st. So. Yeah. And if I can add a couple of things, yeah. right. also creating sort of the, you know, submitting this at 424, you have to have a grants.gov account, which oh, just yeah. creating that can take, you know, weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. so you have to go through this whole process. So thinking about doing it, just make sure you have a grants.gov account set up right away. And then don't wait until March 17th to like enter your information. <laughs> in yes. Sometimes. yes. Of course, it's a work. Yeah. <laughs> That's a it's great always good to start time. entering soon. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you, you can enter and save it along the way. It's not like you have to enter it in one, you know, fell swoop. So yeah, start entering early by all means. Well, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Amanda. I appreciate you both spending your time on the podcast today. I will include your contact information in today's show notes so listeners can reach out to you directly for help with their applications. <clears throat> listeners could also just search Brent Parker Novogratic or search Amanda Reed Novogratic, and that'll probably uh, take them where they need to be to reach out to you. Please, both of you stick around for our off mic section where I have the pleasure of asking you to share some off topic advice and recommendations. Now I'm pleased to reach our off mic section. So Amanda and Brent, uh, both of you are frequent guests to the podcast. So I know I've asked you some of our usual questions already, but I do have uh, two questions that I haven't uh, asked uh, either of you yet. And I'll start with a question that I am putting into the, into the, into circulation here for podcast guests. And as much as I try not to become too addicted to my phone, uh, this question is leading into that addiction. <laughs> uh, I was wondering what, uh, each of you think is the most useful app on your phone. Uh, and what does it do? And I will just say, you can't say mail or calendar. <laughs> sure. So go first. Yeah. Amanda, uh, go all right. I could go. I mean, so, I mean, I'm a parent and I have teenagers in my house and even some that are driving. And so for me, it, it's definitely the life 360 app. It's an app on your phone that basically can show you where everybody in your circle kind of is at. So like, you have your kids and you all in a circle together. And I think as a parent, for some reason, it's given me so much more uh, relaxed and reassurance that I can actually see where my kids are at. So for some reason, I do tend to find that I'm on that app a lot and I love it. So. Well, thank you for that, Amanda. I uh, am a big believer in the Life360 app. So it's yeah. fun that because I had that for all my kids. And I'll just add that I know some parents find that their kids will say that all oh, of the battery ran out yeah, yeah. when they uh, didn't want to be uh tracked you know yeah. the rule with my kids that if you can't keep your phone charged i'll they just you don't need no you don't need the phone I'll oh that's it. true oh that's true that would even be worse than not going out for them so uh yeah. we had this deal your phone stays charged if you yeah phone charge, then you don't need to have the phone and they, they wanted their phone. So yeah. it's, it's charged. I will admit that my kids don't love that. I can see them on the app either. They're, they kind of hate that I could always see where they're at, but yeah, as a parent, I feel like uh, I love that app. So my favorite. Okay. Brett, you can't pick like 360 and, <laughs> and, and your, your child's a little bit younger. So you're not ready for the life 360. Right. Right. Like right. You've only two, but now I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not appreciate that, which is old enough to not appreciate. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, Nova Code knows that. That's clearly the best app. I would say for enjoyment, I kind of have a time between podcast app and an eight ball pool. I'm totally addicted to it. But yeah, those are my apps. So, yeah, not having a child that's old enough to uh, escape me. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's uh, that's great. Uh, I'm not sure what eight ball pool is. So that'll be something I'll have to go <laughs> out. 
It's just like, yeah, it's just a pool. I'm a billiards or pool. Okay. In auto, so. Got it. I also toss in their Audible because I'm a, for, uh, I like uh, Kindle and Audible uh, to keep going, getting through my reading list. No, oh, yeah. Those are good. So let me uh, turn next to goals and to-do lists. And I'm wondering what each of you have, what your favorite tip, or at least a tip, it's kind of sometimes hard to identify what, how do you decide favorite, all the rest, but uh, share a tip for tracking your goals or to-do lists. Um, well, I could go first. I, it's funny, but I still find that I guess I'm probably more old school than people would, than like the younger generation, but I still, every day when I finish work, I make like a list of the things that I want to get done tomorrow. Like this is my list. And then I try to make it my goal every day to like trying to not let the other things distract me from the items on that list. And I, you know, I want to be able to cross them all off by the end of the day. And then at that night I make the next list and there are fire drills that will happen, but I try very hard to make it my goal that I got to get through that list, but I still like pen and paper and just writing it down and being able to cross them out. So. I also keep, I use Outlook calendar for like everything. I just use my calendar app for everything. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. No, I appreciate uh, those ideas. And I definitely agree, Amanda, in terms of there's something about writing it down, pen to paper. Yeah. I'm not sure my kids necessarily see that way, even though I, I say that, but uh, my kids actually do. I do find them doing the pen to paper uh, as opposed to doing everything on the phone because there is something uh, about that. And it feels good when you're checking things off. Oh, yeah. It feels, when you look down and everything has a line through it, that's an amazing feeling at the end of the day. You shouldn't get that. Oh, I think we're revealing that we're all accountants. <laughs> for sure. Well, very good. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Brent. Thank you for joining me on the podcast here today. And to our listeners, I hope you'll tune in next week. And as always, thanks for listening. This weekly podcast has been brought to you by Novogratz and Company, LLP. Archived podcasts are available online at www.novaco.com forward slash podcast or by subscribing to the Tax Credit Tuesday podcast in iTunes. You can find related links referenced in this podcast in our show notes at www.novaco.com forward slash podcast. Novogratik & Company LLP is a national certified public accounting and consulting firm with offices nationwide. Learn more about our professional services at www.novaco.com.